This great Hollywood director launched his career with a documentary that got a convicted murderer off death row. A few years later, he made his feature film debut with the pop duo sensation Sonny and Cher. In 1971, he won an Academy Award for directing the pulse-pounding thriller The French Connection. Two years later, he frightened up another handful of Oscars with The Exorcist, one of the scariest movies of all time. Over the years, he's directed such superstars as Tommy Lee Jones, Al Pacino, and Ashley Judd. Hello, I'm William Friedkin. Well, I grew up in Chicago. Both of my parents were from Kiev, Russia, and uh, they had both come over with their parents uh, shortly after the turn of the 20th century, you know, during one of many pogroms in Russia. I, I graduated high school, and I went uh, right into uh, a television station in Chicago um, called WGN. It was owned by the Chicago Tribune, and they had the largest local independent station in the country at that time. I think it still is. But everything I did was live television. I started in the mailroom, worked my way up from the mailroom. After about a year, I became a floor manager. And uh, then about another year as a floor manager, was like an assistant director in the films or the theater. And then about a year or so later, after a couple of years of apprenticing, I became a live television director. And it wasn't until um, around, uh, oh, about uh, seven years into that that I made my first film, which was a documentary about an a African-American man who was going to the electric chair for murder. And I made the film as a kind of court of last resort to try and save his life. I didn't know how to make a film at the time. I learned by doing it. I had done live television, but the techniques are totally different. So I made this film, and it um, saved this man's life. Um, it was uh, seen, among other people, by the governor of Illinois whose parole and pardon board voted two to one to send this man to the electric chair. His name was Paul Crump. But the governor saw my film and decided, and sent me a note saying that he had decided to pardon Paul Crump to life imprisonment without possibility of parole. <laughs> my first feature film that I directed was called Good Times. It was with Sonny and Cher who were a very hot uh, pop music act in, in that time. It was about 1967. And they had uh, number one hits on the charts. I Got You, Babe, and You Better Sit Down, Kids, and Bang, Bang, and a, a lot of hit songs, some of which have lasted, you know, 40 years. And uh, I was asked to direct this film because I was very young at the time, and. The producer, who was a Hollywood legend named Steve Broidy, thought that because of my youth, I, I um, would relate well to Sonny and Cher. And I guess we did, but I don't have a lot to say about the film. I, I don't think it's very good. Uh, they're very interesting. I'm not sure they were uh, the ideal couple. To st In other words, to put it this way, they didn't make Tracy and Hepburn uh, turn over in their graves. The film did fairly well. It cost very little to make. It did well uh, financially because it cost so little. Columbia Pictures distributed it, and Sonny and Cher were hot at the time. I mean, when people start talking about the job of a filmmaker is daunting, I mean, they must be kidding. It's you have fun. I've always viewed it as a, as a process by which to well, Orson Welles d described it best. He called it the biggest electric train set a boy ever had, the process of filmmaking. Cut. Cut. It never played on Broadway. It only played off Broadway. And then it traveled. Boys in the Band was shown in many other cities of America and a few countries, but it never played on Broadway. I was attracted to it because of the script. The script was wonderful. It was both funny 
and touching. When I was asked to do The Boys in the Band, I was thrilled because I, I think it's one of the finest plays written in this country. I think it's still a very powerful and moving piece of work. So that's what attracted it to me as a film. The French Connection was brought to me by the producer, a man named Phil D'Antoni, and he and I met uh, just socially around Los Angeles shortly after Boys in the Band, and he had seen the handful of films I had made up to and including Boys in the Band. We became friends. He had this story uh, about these two cops and this big drug bust that had happened in 1969. And uh, I met the two cops, Eddie Egan and Sonny Grasso, and I immediately sensed there was a story there, and we set out to make it. We had a number of unsuccessful scripts, and it looked for a lo long time like it wasn't going to get made. Every studio turned it down. Every existing studio in Hollywood passed on it twice until finally Dick Zanuck, who was then the head of 20th Century Fox, called us in. This is after at least a year of trying to get the film made, pounding the pavement every day. The budget was a million and a half dollars. We couldn't raise it. We could get no one interested in it. And then finally Dick Zanuck called us in, the producer and I. His, the producer's name is Phil D'Antoni. And Zanuck said, I don't know what the heck this thing is, but it, I got a hunch it might be something. So I got a million and a half dollars hidden away in a drawer over here. If you guys can make it for that, go ahead. But I won't be around uh, when the film's finished because uh, my dad's going to fire me. And that's what happened. His father, Daryl Zanuck, fired Dick as head of production before we finished the film. Daryl was fired. And the head of the studio was a guy who had been Daryl's film editor, a guy named Elmo Williams. And the 20th Century Fox was in a lot of trouble at that time. And we were fortunate because the only film they had coming out was ours, The French Connection. And by the grace of God, it was successful. I knew the writer, Bill Blatty, just socially. I had met him in a situation that's uh, sort of a long story, but we kept in touch over the years. And then um, I was doing a promotion tour for the French Connection when I got this package in the mail. And I took it with me to several cities in America it was in a brown paper bag, and it was the galleys of The Exorcist from Bill Blatty, who I knew as a comedy writer. He had written a number of uh, very fine comedies for Blake Edwards, one of which was A Shot in the Dark, uh, in which uh, Blatty created the Inspector Clouseau character, which is not something you normally associate with the writer of The Exorcist. One night I was at the end of the tour, I was in San Francisco at some hotel, I don't remember which one, and there I had a dinner appointment at 8 o'clock. I sat down and I opened the manuscript of The Exorcist, and I couldn't stop reading it. I couldn't put it down. I called and canceled my dinner, and I just read the manuscript until I finished it, and I was basically thunderstruck by not simply the plot, but the way he had organized this material. And so I called Bill and I said, what, what is this? And he said, well, it's based on a true story. It took me 15 years to write it. I started writing it as an undergraduate at Georgetown University. There was an actual case in that area involving a 14-year-old boy not a 12-year-old girl as in the novel and the film, but he said, I couldn't um, get any information from the priests at Georgetown who were involved about what had happened in this case, even though it was widely reported in the Washington Post. But I tried to write it as a work of uh, fact, 
which is what it was, I couldn't get enough information, so I decided to write it as fiction. And it, I invented some of the characters from people I knew. And I, as I say, it took 15 years, and it, it's coming out. I said, Bill, it's, it's really sensational. It's just a great piece of work. And he said, would you like to make a film of it? Because I've sold it to Warner Brothers. I said, Bill, I, I would love it. I saw the whole film in my mind's eye after I read it. And I said, yes, I, I, I really would love to do it. Alfred Hitchcock said that the movie is made in pre-production. Then it's simply a matter of going out and filming what you've planned. And that very little is done uh, after that in a Hitchcock film that doesn't conform to the way he made drawings of every scene. I don't do that. I use pre-production to discover the film, to cast the movie, uh, to pick the locations, to uh, pick the crew, and then we'll go out and scout the locations or decide where we might have to build sets. And then I will, I have envisioned the film in my mind's eye before that, but then often I'm uh, influenced by a location to, to change my concept. So whatever I do in the pre-planning stages of a film, I, I have, I've learned to be flexible enough to adjust that when you actually get to the locations, which influence action, it influences character. But in order to get to the set for the first day of shooting, you have to have planned for months and, and months where you're going to shoot, with whom, and how. I don't need to sing its praises. I know that The French Connection is a classic American film. I know it now. I didn't know it while I was making it. I had no idea. I just went from shot to shot. Making a film is akin to doing needlepoint. Knit one, purl two. You just compile one shot after another and you put it together in the cutting room. But as a filmmaker, you have to envision the entire film in your mind's eye before you go out and make it so that you know pretty much what you're shooting is going to wind up in, in the finished film uh, or at least a facsimile of that. But the creative process is at its height in the making of a film in the editing room. The French Connection was completely changed by me in the cutting room. I discovered the plasticity, the uh, ability to shape the material in a cutting room uh, when I was doing the French Connection. Action! I tried to assemble a crew, most of whom have worked with me before. Sometimes they get older or retire or pass away, so I have to seek new people. Or I see a cameraman's work that I really like and I decide to work with a new cameraman. I then cast the film, and as Hitchcock said, casting is at least 50% of the success or failure of a film. It's probably more. But then I will try to communicate my ideas and my visions to the cast and crew. I will then be open to any ideas they may have. Anyone on the crew, anyone in the cast, may give me some ideas that I think are good and I will utilize. So I start to try to form a family out of the film cast and crew. And you do become a family and we're doing it together. It's true that one intelligence may inform a film, yes, but it's the work of many, many hands and many minds and many ideas. And often it starts with the script. Sometimes I've written the script, but a, often a guy who writes, a director who writes his own script is like a man who has himself for a lawyer. 
He has a fool for a lawyer. So that is sometimes, if not often, the case. But more importantly, I try to form a family and get everyone on the same page and be open to all of their suggestions, ideas, and the technical abilities that they can bring to a film. I had done a chase scene for the French Connection, and now I was going to direct another chase scene, and they're not easy to come up with. They're very difficult to do, and they represent pure cinema. Now they're easy to do because of computer-generated imagery. But when I was making these chase scenes for To Live and Die in L.A. and The French Connection and Jade, we couldn't, we didn't have CGI. We had to do everything mechanically. We had to literally do it. And when it came to do To Live and Die in L.A., I wanted to film another chase, and so I start to think about it. And the process is not all that different from a composer sitting down to formulate a melody or an artist to get an image that he can paint. If you start to think about it, if you put your mind and your attention on this problem as it relates to the story that you're filming and the surroundings and the, the place where it's being filmed, you will often get divine inspiration and the sequence will start to dictate itself to you in your mind's eye. And that's certainly true of me and my films, the sequences in my films and the films themselves. I'm simply the vessel through which they pass. I originally cast Richard Gere in that part. Now remember, this is 27 years ago. And I thought that Richard Gere was perfect. And then I got a call from my agent uh, a man named Stan Kamen at the time, may he rest in peace, who also happened to be Al Pacino's agent. And Al and I had been trying to find a film to do together for a long time. I actually started to make Born on the Fourth of July with Al uh, until they ran out of money and couldn't get it made. And so it was dropped and then subsequently made by the writer Oliver Stone and Tom Cruise. I got a call from Cayman saying, look, Al has read your script of Cruising, and he wants to play this part. And so I talked to Jerry Weintraub, and Jerry said, yeah, sounds like a good idea. So we did not go forward and negotiate with Richard Gere. We moved off to Pacino then, because he was possibly the hottest actor in America at that time. My first choice was a guy who was a journalist in New York named Jimmy Breslin, who looked like the Eddie Egan or Popeye Doyle character. And I knew Jimmy very well. And I thought he'd be an interesting guy to, to play this part. Before Breslin, we, we said to Dick Zanuck, we'd like to get Paul Newman. And at that time, Paul Newman was one of the highest paid actors. And he was making $500,000 a movie, which today is chump change for an actor, but back then was very high. And Zanuck said to us, you're not going to get Newman. We can't afford him. I want to make this film for a million and a half dollars. And I don't care who you get. Just get someone who's appropriate in that part and in all the parts. We then went to Peter Boyle. We offered the role to Peter Boyle, who had just played a part Called, in a film called Joe. He played the title character and he was a, a bigot who acted out his bigotry and went around killing black people. And he, he had the physique and the personality of a New York cop. We offered the role to Peter Boyle and he turned it down. And he said, you know, after Joe, I just want to do romantic leads. And the producer of his television series, uh, Everybody Loves Raymond, a lovely man named Phil Rosenthal, who's become a friend of mine, said there wasn't a day on the set of Everybody Loves Raymond that Peter Boyle didn't tell everybody the biggest mistake he ever made was to turn down the French Connection. But it might not have been the same film with him. Who knows? Anyway, Hackman was our, our last choice. 
He wasn't a choice. He, when we couldn't find anyone else, uh, his agent, a woman named Sue Mengers, called and suggested Gene and asked if I would meet with him. And Phil D'Antoni, the producer, and I met with him and we had about a week to decide and under that pressure we decided to go with Gene, whose performance is brilliant, who is very difficult to work with. The most difficult actor I've ever worked with is Gene Hackman, but he's great. He's an American classic. Cut. Cut. And, and I am very pleased with Sorcerer. I don't view it in the same way, let's say, that you may as a, a kind of partial success or partial failure. I, I don't think of any of my films that way. You Look, my films come back big time. I mean, I'm re-releasing Cruising this fall, a film I made 27 years ago. I've just finished making new prints for Warner Brothers, a new DVD, which will come out after a new theatrical. It's getting a gala premiere at the Cannes Film Festival. This is a film I made 27 years ago that is arguably the most controversial film I've ever made. It's coming out again. Not because I said, let's bring it out again. Other people find these films and want to share them with new audiences. This is a new generation that's going to see Cruising and that sees all of my films. So you can never be too careful about not judging a film in its own time. You have to remember that Vincent van Gogh never sold a painting during his lifetime. What does that mean? Does that mean that all the paintings were no good or that it was a question of timing or that he had to wait for a generation to come along to discover what he was all about? So, the, and especially now, with the advent of new media, such as DVDs and soon other more exotic uh, means of transmitting films, you can't make any ultimate judgments about them. And I don't judge films. I don't believe they are meant to be judged. Uh, yes, I've won an Academy Award and my films have won Academy Awards, but I think that's a wonderful thing, but it's a promotion tool for the motion picture industry. It's not a finite judgment, in my opinion, about this film versus that one. It's all about communication. Whether you're communicating with a cast and a crew in television or the theater or, or wherever, it's about communication first with the people you're working with and then ultimately with the audience. And that's the best lesson a young person coming up can learn. It's not how much you know about the equipment uh, or staging techniques, it's how you're able to communicate with other people. I really don't care about the opinion of others other than the people who pay money to see the film in theaters or, or after it's sold to television. And I will never defend a film of mine. The film is its own answer. What I, how close I came to what I had in mind is all that concerns me about a film that I've made.